All right, thank you. Can you hear me okay? I'm gonna yeah, see you. Yes. All right, fantastic. I got a little unmute pop up, but here we go. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Um, so if you're here, uh, you know that what you eat is important for your health. The more whole plant foods, the better, right? But most of us, uh, doctors included, don't know that when we eat is nearly as important. In fact, in just the last few years, scientists have discovered that when we eat and when we don't eat can almost certainly add years to or subtract years from our lives. And it can also help determine whether those years are healthy or diseased. I'm gonna tell you today about uh, three aspects of this research. The first two are about the two main types of fasting, broadly speaking. One of these main types of fasting is daily fasting, which is just fasting for a certain number of hours each day. The second kind of fasting is prolonged fasting, which is fasting for multiple days or even weeks. Now, usually when people speak of fasting for health, they're talking about fasting to heal or fend off somatic diseases diseases of the body. And that's mostly what I'm going to talk about in these first two sections. But in the third section of my talk, I'm going to focus on fasting for mental and neurological health, which I believe has been uh, far neglected for far or <laughs> has been too far neglected for far too long. Um, our friends at The Real Truth About Health have asked me to talk for an hour and a half with uh, about a half hour for questions at the end. So that's what I'm going to aim for. Um, I've never given a talk this long before, so it should be fun to see if my voice, which has been cracking a lot this week, holds up. Okay, so let's start with the latest science on daily fasting, which I found just astonishing as I researched my book, uh, and which might just change how you eat for the rest of your life. Before I'm done with this section, I'm going to leave you with three big principles from scientists and fasting doctors about when to eat that you can use to be healthier. The first thing to know about daily fasting is that you are already doing it. You finish eating at night, for most people it's night, you go to sleep and you break your fast the next morning at breakfast or with your first cup of coffee. The vital question that scientists have begun exploring in just the last say five or 10 years is this, how long or short should our overnight fast be if we wanna be at our healthiest? And the answer that they've come back with just resoundingly is that we're healthier when our overnight fasts are longer. That's why so many people have started doing what are called 16-8 or 18-6 eating patterns, where you fast for 16 or 18 hours a day, and then you take all your calories in the other eight hours or six hours of the day. Eating in a window like that is healthier because it gives our bodies more time to repair more of the parts of our cells that are forever getting damaged and breaking down. See, our bodies are these marvelous self-healing machines. They are constantly making repairs to damaged and broken parts that save us from disease. If our bodies didn't do that, not many of us would be here even just a few years from now. The problem is that our bodies usually make these repairs only at a very low rate. That's because our bodies are busy most of the time doing all the other things that make up our lives. One of those things, one that takes an enormous amount of time and energy is digesting our food, sending the nutrients from that food to cells in every nook of our bodies and putting those nutrients to work in trillions of cells. But when we stop eating for long enough, we give our bodies a break from that very heavy labor and they take advantage of the rest while we're fasting to accelerate the repairs. The fixes that our bodies make during this accelerated repair period are pretty phenomenal. Our cells will patch up more of our miscopied or damaged DNA. Uh, they'll make more antioxidants to counter the oxidative assaults that we endure from free radicals all the time. They'll break down more of our worn out organelles, <coughs> excuse me, those little vital parts inside our cells, and then they'll send the broken down components from the organelles onward to become the building blocks of fresh new cellular parts. That's a process, as some of you know, that's called autophagy. Our bodies will also kill off more cells that are too far gone to be repaired in a process called apoptosis. And then when we refeed after our fasting period, our stem cells will replace those sacrificed cells with healthy new cells. 
All of these repairs and more not only save us from disease in the long run, but also yield immediate benefits. So when we fast, we have less body-wide inflammation. And systemic inflammation, we know, is the handmaid to so many awful diseases. If we have high blood pressure, it will decrease on a fast. If we're insensitive to insulin, which can lead to diabetes and other metabolic distress, we grow more sensitive to it when we fast. These wonderful repair mechanisms are not unique to us. A billion years of evolution have bestowed some version of them on nearly every creature on the planet. But although they've been around forever, which is why I called my book, The Oldest Cure in the World, scientists are just now learning how to use them to our advantage. One of scientists' most important findings, one you'll want to know as you think about when to eat and when not to eat each day, is that our bodies don't start making these crucial repairs the moment we stop eating. It's not as though you, um, you swallow your last calories, whether they're carrot sticks or French fries, and 10 minutes later, your body says, all right, now we're fasting. Uh, we're going to start making these repairs. It turns out that there's a metabolic cost to our bodies in making the switch from processing nutrients to making repairs, and the body doesn't want to change over to repair mode until it's sure we're done eating. It doesn't wanna make that switch and pay that metabolic price, and then an hour later have a stuff more food down our throats, again, no matter whether the food is broccoli or Big Macs, because if we do that, our body will have to switch out of repair mode and go back into nutrient processing mode, which exerts even more of a metabolic cost. So instead, what the body does is it waits. About six hours after we've eaten or drunk our last calories, the body makes the switch from nutrient processing to repairs. But even then, it acts like it's not very confident and the repairs accelerate only slowly. They increase hour by hour until about 12 hours after our last calories when the repairs go into a kind of overdrive. And the repairs keep increasing at a rapidly growing rate with every hour we fast beyond those 12 hours. Unfortunately, studies show that most of us are eating or drinking something caloric over 14 or even 15 hours a day. So that means most people are fasting for only nine or 10 hours a night. Since it takes six hours to get into repair mode, they're getting just three or four hours of repairs each night and they are never getting into that overdrive mode of repairs that starts at about 12 hours into a fast. That's why scientists encourage longer overnight fasts. They found that our health uh, improves starting with an overnight fast of at least 12 hours and the benefits increase impressively with every hour we add to that 12. It makes sense, right? Someone who fasts for 16 hours a night is getting a full 10 hours in repair mode, four of those hours in overdrive repair mode. So that's the first big principle of daily fasting. We're healthier when we fast for at least 12 hours a night, and we get healthier still with even longer fasts of up to 18 hours, which would mean a daily eating window as short as six hours. Scientists don't know yet whether uh, an even narrower eating window, say four hours or even two hours, is better or worse for our health. Some of them worry that cramming all of our food into so short a window might counterbalance um, the benefits that we'd get from the longer fast. So for now, not many scientists recommend narrowing your eating window to fewer than six hours a day. Let's remember here that eating in a window of 12 or fewer hours each day is nothing new or crazy. In fact, it's how most humans and humanoids all over the world probably ate for thousands of millennia. We can pretty confidently speculate that even before humans existed, our predecessor hominids ate almost entirely by daylight. They would start uh, eating sometime after the sun came up in Africa, and then they would stop eating before the sun went down when nocturnal predators had every advantage over them. Eating after the sun went down was a pretty good way to get your genes weeded out of the gene pool. And this was true as well once humans uh, came onto the scene too. So we almost certainly evolved to eat during the African daytime, which is to say in a window of no more than about 12 hours. Okay, here's another thing you need to know. Most of us today who practice this kind of, <laughs> this 
uh, kind of time-restricted eating, as it's called, we do it by skipping breakfast. We wait to eat until maybe 11 a.m. or noon. We eat for six or eight hours, and around 7 p.m. or so, we stop eating. That's certainly the way that I used to do it before I did the research on my book. But it turns out that eating uh, all your food in the afternoon and evening isn't the healthiest way to eat. The new research suggests that the healthiest way to eat is to put your eating window in the morning and early afternoon. That's because our circadian rhythms have hardwired us to process nutrients most efficiently early in the day. By mid-afternoon, those circadian rhythms will guarantee that our bodies start shutting down the nutrient processing machinery. So we get worse and worse at moving nutrients along as the day goes on. And by the nighttime, we're frankly just pretty terrible at it. We can still digest food if we eat at night, of course, uh, but the problem is that the food lingers longer where it shouldn't, doing damage not just to our gastrointestinal tract, but to other parts of the body as well. The aspect of this metabolic slowdown that has been best studied uh, has to do with glucose and insulin. Glucose, of course, is the sugar from the carbohydrates in our meals, and it's our body's preferred fuel. Insulin, as most of you probably know, is the hormone that takes that glucose once it's been digested and sent into our bloodstream and moves it out of our arteries and into the cells where the glucose is used as fuel. As diabetics know, if insulin fails to move the glucose out of our arteries, the glucose will ding up the arterial walls, which can eventually harden. And that in turn can lead to strokes or heart attacks, dementia or impotence, blindness, amputations, uh, and many other conditions that are just god awful. What scientists have recently discovered is that our insulin production, like just about everything else in our nutrient processing machinery, is strictly governed by a circadian rhythm. In the morning, our bodies produce a ton of insulin. So when we eat early, glucose is ushered very efficiently out of our bloodstream and into our cells. But in the afternoon, our body starts shutting down our insulin production. Uh, our cells will also become less receptive to insulin in the afternoon. So they don't hear the knock on the door from insulin when it comes to ask the cells to open up and let the glucose in. All this means that when we eat in the late afternoon or evening, glucose lingers longer in our arteries, uh, longer than is good for us. Uh, and this likely contributes to a lot of our atherosclerosis, heart attacks, Alzheimer's, and so on. This rhythm with insulin is so strong that if you give pre-diabetics a meal at 7 a.m. and then give them the exact same meal at 7 p.m., their blood sugar will rise only modestly after the morning meal, but after the evening meal, many of them will test fully diabetic. In uh, similar tests in healthy people, many of them will test pre-diabetic after the late meal. This circadian slowdown happens in nearly every aspect of our digestion and nutrient processing, and we apparently can do nothing to change it.